back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you. We've, we've covered a lot of ground and very little of it relevant to the question before the Rules Committee today or the question that was presented so spectacularly to Oversight and Judiciary a couple of weeks back. Uh, we've had a year and a half of investigations, depositions, written testimony, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, and House Republicans have not turned up any evidence of wrongdoing by the President or his associates. And it's quite a contrast. I mean, there are no impeachable offenses by a man who has lived his entire adult life in the glare of public life. It's been decades. <coughs> and of course, this is a marked contrast to the former president who spent decades shir shirking the law and his tax obligations with shady real estate deals and whose cr criminal conduct became glaringly apparent when he stepped out of those shadows and his lack of respect for the rule of law and for constitutional norms. And it is that contrast and its political implications that seem to have brought us here today. Um, you know, we've seen over the last year and a half, we've seen one conspiracy theory after another get shot down or evaporate when it was exposed to the light of day. But our Republican colleagues have doubled down on those theories, including some pretty spectacular ones today, wasting the time and money of three separate congressional committees on a wild goose chase that has not turned up anything. So after all these failures, they've manufactured this crazy controversy to try to kick around the Attorney General and to justify this baseless contempt resolution. It's another desperate attempt to save face after, if it weren't so sad, it would be ridiculous, but after a failed investigation, there is no crime, there is no wrongdoing, there are no impeachable offenses, but it's an election year. And as some of our colleagues on this committee have said, Republican majority hasn't accomplished anything. So here we are, there's no legitimate legislative pur purpose for forcing the DOJ to turn over audio tapes of um, its interviews with President Biden. It has the transcript, which was certified by the Trump appointee special counsel um, as being a true and accurate um, transcript of, of those interviews, um, although we're now hearing today some suggestion that somehow it's not. So it's painfully obvious, especially given some of the doctoring that we saw just this weekend of presidential remarks and videos and such. Um, this is to distract. This is to distort. This is to push out more lies. Um, and the repetition of the lies doesn't make them any less untrue. Um, so it's a waste of congressional time. It's a waste of taxpayer dollars to continue pushing these charades. Um, Representative Raskin, um, we just heard some pretty spectacular statements about this push to hold the attorney general in contempt being a matter of oversight, although it's allegedly with respect to um, this crazy impeachment effort. Do you have any comment? Well, I'm sorry my friend Mr. Reschenthaler is not here because I take him to be a really serious lawyer. And um, his assertion is that um, we can hold or we should hold uh, in contempt any attorney general or president of the United States for that matter or cabinet member um, who withhold, withholds any document. I just want to know both retroactively with respect mm -hmm. to the more than 100 investigations where Donald Trump stonewalled Congress, whether he believes that contempt uh, properly was uh, in play there, and he would have supported contempt against President Trump, and he, whether he would support uh, contempt in the future against any president who has a disagreement. Um, you know, a lot of these are substantive arguments being made about executive privilege, but of course, um, presidents, White Houses of both Democratic and Republican prominence assert executive privilege all the time. Should we be holding the president in contempt every time there's a disagreement over executive privilege? Of course, uh, Donald Trump did it in the Mazars case, uh, and um, he lost that case when we finally went to the Supreme Court. We didn't hold him in contempt in the meantime. We're still trying to get documents that we were granted under the Mazars case. This would be a great opportunity for Mr. Chairman, who's a newfound champion of transparency and light and disclosure, to 
announced today that he will turn over all of the documents that he's cooperated with Trump's lawyers in suppressing from Mazar's. And I wonder whether he would feel at this point all of those Mazar's documents should be turned over. Um, and this is not a joke. This is for real stuff. And why does it have to be a partisan question? Um, so there might be some interesting issues raised in court about the difference between a written or an audio transcript. I'm not convinced by what they're saying, but I do think it is truly absurd to say it rises to the level of holding the Attorney General of the United States in contempt when they were defending a president who blocked more than 100 different investigations, including an impeachment investigation, which is perhaps the most serious power we wield because that's how we control presidents who engage in high crimes and misdemeanors and corrupt attacks on the U.S. Constitution. Well, and yeah, and as famously as, as we know, this, that impeachment in, in part hinged upon the mm -hmm. fact that the then president refused to answer questions, refused to show up um, and cooperate. Um, well, it's like in this case, both he, you know, I, I'm struck by uh, Ms. Hageman's remarks because uh, I'm actually um, amazed at the similarities between these two cases. Both Joe Biden, uh, both Hunter Biden and Donald Trump were given the presumption of innocence. Both were given a jury trial. Both had a right to counsel, which they exercised by paying for uh, exceptional private counsel. Both of them had a right to testify. Neither of them chose to testify, um, including Donald Trump, who now wants to testify to the world about how uh, it was a, the fix was in and it was rigged and all that stuff. But he wasn't willing to get up on the stand and testify about why he didn't do it. No, he didn't want to do that. Fair enough. He exercised his constitutional right. Both of them had a right to jury trial and both of them had a right to unanimous verdict. And in both cases, the jury unanimously found in Trump's case that he was guilty on 34 different counts and in Hunter Biden's case that he was guilty on three different counts. Now, Ms. Hagman made a series of what are essentially appellate arguments. For example, she says that um, this or that witness should have been allowed to testify beyond the um, domain that the judge allowed him to testify. For example, Brad Smith was allowed to testify within a certain range, but not on irrelevant things. Now, she says, you know, it should have been the full 100 yards of the football field and not the 20 yards that he was allowed to testify on. Great, that's an appellate argument. Ms. Hagman sounds like an excellent criminal defense appeals lawyer, but is it grounds for attacking the rule of law in America and the system of justice in New York, much less the federal system of justice, which had nothing to do with it? And they're deliberately confusing people about that. Hunter Biden was prosecuted by federal prosecutors in federal court. Donald Trump was prosecuted in that particular case in state court by state prosecutors. I thought state law and the federalist system was something they supported, but apparently not. Not if it goes against Donald Trump. They're willing to just throw the whole thing out the window. But those are just appellate arguments. And Donald Trump, as far as I know, is going to exercise his right to appeal. So I'm happy you know, to go outside with you, Ms. Hageman, and you can give me three hours of description of what the appellate arguments are going to be, but ultimately an appellate court is going to sort it out. I'm a little bit more interested in just the rule of law and in justice. I'll quote uh, a former colleague of ours, Liz Cheney, who was the head of the Republican conference, and she said, at this moment, we're confronting a domestic threat that we've never faced before. That is a former president who's attempting to unravel the very foundations of our constitutional republic. I don't know if you guys remember Liz Cheney, but she said, Republicans cannot both be loyal to Donald Trump and loyal to the Constitution at the same time, she said. So that's in honor of a very distinguished Republican colleague, former colleague of ours. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. You raised some interesting points. I mean, this whole process here, the three committees, the relentless search for nothing, apparently, um, really has smacked of political theater. And, and you raise the point that, you know, if, if this is about oversight and enforcing congressional subpoenas, um, how can it not be a partisan effort when they dropped enforcement of the subpoenas for Jim Jordan, for um, a host of people who uh, allegedly conspired with the president to try to subvert the election results on January 6th? Yeah. I mean, they, they've dropped all of that enforcement. Um, you know, I mean, we don't have to be naive about partisanship. Partisanship is built into our constitutional system. It's an expression of 
constitutional health that people have a right to participate, to form political parties, to, you know, express themselves in that way. Um, and, you know, on behalf of our colleagues, they would probably say that Jim Jordan and Scott Perry and Andy Biggs and so on, that they had whatever legal arguments they wanted to raise against being subpoenaed there. Okay, but so does the Attorney General of the United States. So they would have opposed a contempt motion against Jim Jordan or Andy Biggs or Mo Brooks or Kevin McCarthy. But why would they support a contempt motion when there's a reasonable difference of view about uh, whether an audio tape and a transcript um, serve the same function, especially when this attorney general and his administration have gone way beyond whatever any of our GOP <clears throat> colleagues did in terms of complying with a subpoena and way beyond whatever Donald Trump ever did in terms of complying with the subpoena. So we all are partisans here. We don't have to play make-believe about that, but we at least should try to adhere to some basic principles as opposed to just turn on and turn off our principles according to whether it's going to affect the Democrats or the Republicans. Thank you. I, I think at this point I, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentlelady. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, 